Enter Sam. <laughs> I'm waiting for your haircut, buddy. <laughs> oh, uh, hello, Major. Um, there's something I probably should tell you by now. Oh, what's that, Benito? Have I been promoted? Have I got my own show? Oh, maybe we could do a whole hairdressing explanations. <laughs> Will that make the cut? <laughs> yeah, no, that's not what I'm going to tell you. Oh, no? What is it, then? Look, Major, we've had our good times. We've had our ups and downs. But I've really got to think about going forward and who I can see blossoming. Um, in the future. Um, and for that reason, I'm, I'm struggling here. Um, but I think, weighing it all up, I feel like Sam is probably the better candidate. He understands my needs a bit more than you do. We've become increasingly close over the past few months compared to you who hasn't appeared in Abelita's explanations for a good year or so before um, the other day. Um, so, for that reason, Major, you're fired. What? No, not even another position? No. I can give you a new style? No. A Sunday job? No. Into the West Christmas special? No. 30 second clip at the end of each video just for a bit of entertainment? No. 10 second video? No. Ah, uh, 1.23 second video? Get out! Oh, my foot! My foot! I've cut my toe! I've cut my toe! I've cut my toe! I've cut my toe! Cut my toe. Right, hello everyone, it's the 10th video in the Sensory Ecology series. I've got a terrible cold, but you know what? It doesn't matter because doing a video on my binocular and colour vision, I know is what the doctor said would cheer me up. So, we're going to carry on from where we left off. Last time we started talking about eyes, now we're going to look at specific types of vision. Now, binocular vision, to start off with, is quite simple really. It is what it says on the tin. It's vision with two eyes. And it's the positioning of those eyes on the head which determines an animal's field of view. So for example, many prey items have eyes on either side of their head, yeah? Think of a horse or, I don't know, an antelope or something. And that's for them to look out for predators, yeah? Very important. But what's also important that the fields of view overlap at the front. And that phenomenon is called stereopsis. Okay, so each eye sees different things, but um, there's parallax, isn't there? So the parallax between the two eyes creates one single image, which is interpreted by the brain. And it's this which gives us our depth perception, the ability of us to see in 3D. Now, as we mentioned last time, not all animals have two eyes, clearly. Spiders are very interesting. They have four pairs of eyes. The jumping spiders are even more weird. In the retina of each of these eyes, six muscles adjust it slightly. Now inside that retina, there are four layers of photoreceptive cells. And between each of these eyes, unlike in our eyes, there's no binocular overlap. Okay, so that means each eye is looking in a completely different direction. Yes, yeah, so there's no parallax here, which is what we have to deal with. So instead, the jumping spiders get their depth perception by measuring the amount of blur in between the separate images. And this is truly unique. It hasn't been seen in any other animal. We talked about how each eye sees a completely different image and how it's the parallax which builds up um, this depth perception, yeah, due to the binocular disparity. And that's exactly the same when you're looking through a pair of binoculars as well. So imagine you're trying to focus in on a particular interesting bird. You focus it so the image you see is basically round, yeah? James Bond has his binoculars set up incorrectly all the time. For very basic depth perception judgments, the brain uses this thing called the horopter. And that's a circle where objects here fall on corresponding retinal points in the two eyes. So if you move an object around the horopter, 
the, um, that object will fall on exactly the same photoreceptors in each of the two eyes. And we don't need to know the ins and outs, but it's going to help us to explain some pretty interesting effects, such as this thing called the Pulfrick effect. Now, I was going to attempt to demonstrate this, but I realised it was going to be blooming impossible, so I'll just describe it to you instead. <laughs> if you take um, a section, if you rip apart your sunglasses and you get the filter out and put it in front of your eye, um, and you watch the appropriate video on YouTube, it should be able to build up a 3D image. And that's all due to the amount of photon flux, yeah? And this was spot, this thing called response latency, and the two are very much linked. Because, you know, if you do the neuro, the more stimulus you have, the stronger the stimulus, usually the faster the response, okay? So the lower the photon flux, the smaller the amount of photons, the greater the latency in responding. So if you put this over you, well this lets less light through than no filter there, obviously. Okay, so if I was to put this over my eye, then light entering this eye will arrive sooner than light um, see, going into this eye. Well, I say arrive sooner, they arrive at the same time, but this eye responds quicker than that eye because of the lower photon flux reaching this eye. Okay? So that means, if I'm looking at the camera now, I'm seeing that camera pretty much right now in real time. But this eye, because of the greater response latency, I'm seeing the, that camera as it was at some time in the past. <laughs> Admittedly, not that long ago, but you get the idea. That means if you look at the appropriate video on YouTube, that gives the um, impression that um, an object is moving elliptically. Okay, it's creating a 3D image. So what we've seen here is that the response latency of the two eyes, which is determined by the amount of light reaching um, each of them, determines our binocular vision, what we perceive. Okay? That's all we really need to know about binocular vision. Let's move on to something a bit more fascinating, and that is colour vision. Okay, colour vision then. Well, we talked about three episodes ago that the answer to that question, the key answer, were the opsins. They're the protein component of our photopigments, yeah? And they consist of seven transmembrane domains with eight alpha helices in total. Okay? Now, seeing as though these are proteins, that means they must have genes coding for them. And that is indeed true, there are opsin genes, which means we can build a phylogeny of these genes and where on earth they've come from. Okay, just as a side point, the end terminus of an opsin is extracellular, so outside the cell, and the C terminus is intracellular. Oh well, who cares? Um, so these are the different types of opsin then. There's the invertebrate opsins, which we're not really going to go into in that much detail, but they're the kind that are specific to invertebrates. We don't really care about them so much. P. What's P? These are the extraretinal opsins. These are photoreceptors that don't necessarily need to be found in the eye. They can be found in all sorts of funky places across the body. Yeah, it's seen in, um, for example, the, the tail of uh, many crustaceans. So that's kind of weird, isn't it? So, I mean, they're not necessarily eyes as such, but they're certainly photoreceptors. But once again, we don't need to worry about them too much. The main ones are the ones from here onwards. So the M slash LWS, we'll explain why there's a slash there in a second. There's SWS1, SWS2, RH1, and RH2. These are the names of the genes which code for these opsin proteins. Now when studying a particular opsin, we're looking for the lambda max, which we talked about last time. That's the wavelength of maximum sensitivity. But we've also got to remember, as we explained three episodes ago, this idea of univariance. Not one opsin um, can only absorb one wavelength. That would be ridiculous, because we've only got three cones in our eyes, so that means we'd only be able to see three wavelengths. That's clearly not true. There's a whole range of, um, 
of wavelengths which our photopigments can pick up. There's just certain wavelengths which um, photoreceptors are naturally more sensitive to. Okay, and I showed you a pretty diagram um, which showed the lambda max, all that, you know, in that wonderful video. <laughs> yes, good times. We also learned if you want to change the absorption spectrum of a particular opsin, then it's good to make mutations which are nearer the chromophore. That's the light absorbing molecule, which in our eyes is the uh, molecule retinal. Okay? If you, if you make mutations in amino acids nearer the chromophore, then that will have a greater effect on the sort of chemical electron layout of the molecule and it may shift the absorption spectrum, meaning it will have a different lambda max. Now I've listed the sort of ranges that these um, opsins work at on the board here. I'm not going to go through them all. But what is interesting is this one here. SWS1, that range is 360 to 430 nanometers. Okay, now we talked about last time that the visible spectrum of light is between 400 and 700 nanometers. That's the visible um, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. This one goes way before that. So that means the opposite, SWS1, is inherently UV sensitive. And being able to see UV could be quite useful for loads of different organisms. For example, in plant-pollinator interactions, loads of flowers have what we call UV nectar guide, which direct um, a pollinator to where it wants to go, so to where all the nectar is, which incidentally is where all the pollen is as well, which is what the flower wants. Some birds can see UV, and this can be affected by just mutations in two amino acid positions. It's quite easy. And if you draw a phylogeny, um, you see that it's evolved about nine independent times. It's a brilliant example of convergent evolution. So why do birds want to see UV? Well, a lot of birds are pollinators, a lot of the hummingbirds, for example, so they may want to use it in the same way as a bee would to detect those nectar guides. Some, a more obscure example, is to detect whether there's predators on an island. How do they do that? Well, mice wee gives off UV. Yeah? Well, I don't think it's just mice wee. I think it's, in general, rodents. The urine of rodents emits UV radiation. So imagine you're a goose and you want to check whether an island that you land on um, is free of predators. Well, you can just fly across and see if there's any UV emitted from the island, which is from the urine of the mice. Because if there's loads of mice there, then that's an indication that there aren't many predators there to eat the mice, which could eat the geese as well, right? So that's quite clever, isn't it? Let's talk about eutherian colour vision then. Now, eutheria, of course, is the main clade of mammals, the placental mammals. So it basically involves all mammals that exist, except the marsupials and the monotremes, like the platypus and the echidna, okay? This is what we think the ancestor of all eutherians had. They had RH1, so rhodopsin 1, that's the non-colour sensitive opsin, okay? That's what you find in the rods in your eye. There's SWS1 and M slash LWS. And a guy called Jacobs looked at differences in the lambda maxes of these opsins across eutheria, and he found that they were quite different. Primates have taken this one step further. They've duplicated this gene, the M slash LWS, into two separate genes. So that explains why the slash is there. They've duplicated it into an MWS and an LWS. So now primates have three colour receptive um, opsins, and then obviously you've got your RH1. That's exactly what us humans have, because obviously we're primates, aren't we? But the lambda maxes of these three colour receptive um, opsins aren't evenly spaced. In an ideal world, you'd want all these opsins to overlap a little bit, but as little as possible, so you have a broader range a visible spectrum that you can see in. That's not the case. Let's have a look at the diagram. This 
basically represents what I'm saying. So basically, this is evolution in action. It's directional selection in action. Over evolutionary time, those three curves will slowly start to move apart. So they're more spaced out, so you've got greater optical range. And as I mentioned earlier, the SWS1 pigment is a little bit UV sensitive. But unfortunately, our eyes filter out, our lenses filter out all the UV, so we don't actually see in UV. Okay, sorry to disappoint. But people who have had their lenses removed and replaced with another lens do somehow get the ability to see in UV. If you were to look into the New World Monkeys, the Platyrrhini, if you want to be fancy, then we don't see this opsin duplication. On the X chromosome, so the sex chromosome, there's only one um, opsin gene. So that creates an interesting situation. Because, you know, basic GCSE biology, if you have two X chromosomes, you're a woman. If you have an X and a Y, you're a male, right? So that means females can be what we call trichromatic if on the X chromosome they have two different opsin genes, okay? They can also be dichromatic if they have the same opsin gene on each X chromosome, but males, on the other hand, can only be dichromats. That's because there's only one LWS gene on the X chromosome, okay? And it's this which allows um, these New World monkeys to distinguish between red and green, which can be quite useful if you're trying to pick the ripest berries on the bush. A brilliant experiment done by Dolgin et al. on squirrel monkeys was, well, squirrel monkeys and New World monkeys, they're found across the tropics in South America. And what you can do is, if you insert the gene um, into the eye of a squirrel monkey, which is originally a dichromat, so there are only two photoreceptors, two colour photoreceptors, then you can transform it from a dichromat into a trichromat. So that's incredible. So just by inserting one gene, you can switch that monkey from being red-green colourblind to see, basically, the way we see. Well, not exactly, but you know what I mean. This Jacobs guy again did a similar experiment with mice. If you cross normal mice with transgenic mice with the human um, M and L W S genes inserted, then you'll produce offspring which are trichromats, right? All rodents are dichromats. You suddenly produce a trichromat. So this just shows how adaptable the brain is. If you just insert a gene, our brain will be able to make sense of it and turn it, turn it into colour, okay? Incredible. Now what interesting stuff's going on in the avian retina then? Well, they have something different. They have these things called oil droplets, which are different colours, and they filter out the light depending on the wavelengths. So what's the point in that then? Well, that reduces the overlap between the different receptors because it's filtering out loads of wavelengths. So if you were to look at that absorbance curve of all the opsins, you find that they don't overlap as much. They're a lot thinner. The peak sensitivity does tend to decrease, but it does optimize color vision significantly. And it's a bit of a mystery on how us Eutherians lost them, actually, because they're, they're found in most vertebrates. Obviously, each oil droplet matches a certain photoreceptor, and these can be coupled either optically or electrically, so they can come in pairs as well. Now, colour vision then. If you've only got one colour-sensitive photoreceptor, then that's no good. That's not going to give any colour vision at all. That's because there's what we call a sensitivity ambiguity. We can't determine wavelength from a single photon count. You need at least two colour photoreceptors so you can compare. Well, obviously these two photopigments need to have different absorbance curve because if they had pretty similar ones then you might as well have one photoreceptor. And how these photopigments perceive colour is all about this what we call an excitation ratio. And this is independent of intensity. So it doesn't matter how intense the stimulus is, the ratio of excitation between one photoreceptor and another will allow you to distinguish the colour. 
yeah? Because let's say the lambda max of the MWS um, cone will always have a peak sensitivity at around green. But even though something like the LWS cone can respond to green, the ratio of the amount of excitation between the photoreceptors will still be large enough for you to be able to distinguish the colour. It's this which gives dichromatic colour vision in a scenario when you've only got two photoreceptors. But then you've got three cones, and then things get really exciting, that's what we have. That way you can build up a 3D colour space. Now what's that? Now we, the only way I can show you, explain that is by showing you a diagram, okay? So here it is. So here we have a 3D axis then, and as the intensity changes, that point will move along a vector. Now, you can rearrange these three axes into a triangle, and that gives something called a chromaticity diagram. So the three axes, we've got the LWS, the MWS, and the SWS, right? Now, if only, let's say, the LWS photoreceptor receives a signal, then it will just move along that LWS axis. As you can see at the centre of that diagram is a white point, which is where all three photoreceptors are activated. This diagram builds up a representation of excitation relationships in the form of colour. Now one thing to point out here is that the MWS cone, there's no wavelength that only the MWS cone absorbs. So that gives this white space. And that's the same for SWS. So that's why that isn't shaded in with a particular colour. Now if you move on to tetrachromats, that's animals with four different photopigments, then it gets even more interesting. You get into a four-dimensional problem. And what are tetrachromats? Well, a lot of birds are tetrachromats, so they have really good colour vision. In this case, the white point can be reached in many ways. And as we talked about earlier, oil droplets are important um, in avian colour vision. And they narrow the peaks and reduce overlap between the receptors. And you can kind of see that in this diagram. Because if that, you follow that line, it tends to follow the axes. So it doesn't go into the centre of that um, four-cornered shape, because that's where all the overlaps are. It tends to go round the axes instead. So that allows the animal to have a much broader colour space. For example, if oil droplets are added to a goldfish, then you see a change from the pattern before to the pattern you see now. Where, where this is where the colour space is closer to the individual axes. So by having these oil droplets, the tetrachromats can increase the range of their available colour space. Very nice. Now, this is where things start to get complicated. <laughs> Okay, now I've done a brilliant diagram on the board here of how this all works, but let's go through it. Now the first thing to explain is how we encode brightness. Now that's actually quite simple, because brightness is just the sum of the photon flux arriving at all four of the photoreceptors, the three colour receptors and the one rod. Yeah, I should have mentioned, by the way, I don't know whether I mentioned that LWS, L stands for long wave. I mean, it pretty stands to reason, doesn't it? Long wave, medium wave, short wave. So short wave's blue, long wave's red, medium wave's green in the middle, right? So, brightness, that's quite simple, yeah? We kind of knew that already. Now, how do we determine hue at a neural level? Okay, hue, very nice chap. Um, so we can distinguish him, he's quite a noticeable character, but colour, it's slightly more complicated than that, because in a ganglion cell, let's say you have um, a long, an LWS photoreceptor and an NWS photoreceptor connected to a ganglion cell, right? Now if that's the case, any impulses from an LWS, so from a red photoreceptor, that will produce an on signal, and anything from a green photoreceptor will produce an off signal. Okay, so that gives you two different types of receptive fields, because if, you'll, if you have, if you're looking at a very green object, then you're gonna have a very negative signal. If you're looking at a very red object, you'll have a very 
um, positive signal. So the two types of receptive fields are red and green on the outside, and green in the centre and red on the outside. Okay, that's for the first two receptive fields, and it's that which determines hue. Um, the difference between red and green is what we call C1. So it's the ratio of that and what we call C2 minus C3 which determines the hue. Now, what's C2 minus C3? Well, that is what um, is very useful in colourfulness. Okay, so C2 and C3 is when you have all three photoreceptors connected, three colour photoreceptors connected to a ganglion cell. And if that's the case, this is what happens. Here, the red and the green are both positive, and it's the blue that's negative. Okay? Something I should have mentioned, by the way, is that red and green determine hue because they're antagonistic colours. Yeah? There's no such thing as a greeny red or a reddy green. Okay? They're antagonistic. So that's useful here, then, because if red and green are both positive, that gives you yellow, apparently, which kind of makes sense, because yellow is kind of in between red and green, isn't it? Well, yeah? So, red and green are positive, so that means you've got two more colour receptive fields now. You've got a blue with yellow on the outside, and yellow on the inside with blue on the outside, okay? We don't have a yellow photoreceptor, as you may have guessed, but because of the red and green both giving a positive signal, we can perceive yellow. Okay? So that is the mechanisms of colour vision. That's how we determine brightness, hue, and colourfulness is the strength of what we get from this input of the three colour receptors and the hue as well, because obviously that adds to it. Another example of an interesting phenomenon regarding colour vision is the idea of a colour after image. Now, have a look and stare at this. Right, you saw what happened, right? Now, why is that? Well, that's all to do with this thing called photoreceptor bleaching. Now, your photoreceptors were focusing in on that weirdly coloured Union Jack for quite a while, right? Now, it takes time for those photoreceptors, after they've seen an image, to flip back so they can be reactivated again. So, they've been spent, if you like. So that means when you're presented with a white image, they can't respond, okay? So when you look at that white screen, all the other photoreceptors which weren't activated by that diagram, so the Union Jack was yellow and a sort of turquoisey green, wasn't it? So those photoreceptors couldn't respond, but all the others did, naturally, when they look at something white, okay? Because white is just the culmination, accumulation of all those photoreceptors, okay? So that means you saw the Union Jack as you should have seen it, which is red, blue and white, and it made you feel very patriotic. So that's why the colour after image is an inverse of the colour pattern, right? Because the density of the photopigments which you were focusing on to start with is being reduced because they've just activated so they can't be reactivated. And after time, of course, those photopigments will return to normal and you'll just see a white screen and be very disappointed. Okay? There are also these things called motion-sensitive ganglion cells where, depending on where an object is in space, determines how those ganglion cells fire impulses to the CNS. Okay, and you see that, so if you're on a train, for example, and you look out the window and you see everything rushing past, then you look in front of you, everything starts to move and you get a bit dizzy, okay? Presumably that's how you get dizzy, <laughs> yeah? Because of your motion-sensitive ganglion cells not quite keeping up with things, okay? Well, that is colour vision for you. That was a bit technical, wasn't it? But, ah, oh, it's done now. We can all live our lives again. So I'll see you next time.